special program about coronavirus where we will discuss a few items about the virus, about its mode of transmission, about its similarities and differences with uh, the flu, about some treatment options, uh, about uh, the immune system specifically, as well as some myths that have surrounded this particular topic. Before I begin this presentation, I'd like to thank freeeducation.us as well as Radio uh, Kabir for uh, arranging for this uh, program. I hope that you will enjoy it. My name is Nizam Misagi. I'm a board certified anesthesiologist. I work in the Phoenix area and uh, the name of my practice is Grand Canyon Anesthesiology Consultants. I also have a faculty position as a clinical assistant professor at the University of Arizona School of Medicine, Phoenix campus. I am uh, not a virologist, I'm not an epidemiologist. However, due to my very significant exposure uh, while taking care of patients to uh, this particular uh, pandemic, uh, we have received very significant instruction about what to do as healthcare providers, as well as I've done extensive research and uh, uh, delving into this topic to understand um, what we need to do and how we need to educate the public about the uh, hazards of this particular pandemic. I will try to keep this presentation short and limited to uh, about 30 minutes or less in hopes of being able to reach a uh, larger viewership. Coronaviruses have been known for a very long time uh, to the medical community. Uh, we've had a few strains of coronaviruses that have affected humans. Uh, typically, coronaviruses cause a mild disease, uh, typically a respiratory problem. Um, however, in recent uh, couple of decades, we've had two most notable coronavirus outbreaks one of them in early 2000s uh, called SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, which was from the coronavirus family. And subsequent to that, um, within the last decade, we had MERS, which is Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, both of which are coronaviruses, uh, both of which with significant more mortality, however, neither of which reached a pandemic status. The uh, current coronavirus that is dubbed COVID-19, coronavirus disease 19 for the year 2019 when it was first discovered, is a novel virus. By saying that it's novel, it means that its RNA sequence is different than coronaviruses that were previously known to us. Every virus typically has either a DNA or an RNA uh, sequence. This is one of the RNA viruses, such as some other uh, illnesses that we're familiar with. The flu virus is an RNA virus. Ebola is an RNA virus as well. And there is a subtle difference uh, in terms of how these viruses behave compared to DNA viruses. I'll get into that in this presentation if there is time. And uh, the reason is called coronavirus. Corona uh, means crown specifically. And so if you look at the uh, structure of the virus under electron microscopy, it has tiny little projections on its surface that are reminiscent of a crown. That's why it's called a coronavirus. So typically a virus is an outer layer that's made out of glycoproteins and a code on the inside of it, which is in this particular case, RNA, that encodes its genetic content. This virus uh, can enter the um, respiratory system uh, most common presentation is respiratory, but basically the things that you would think of as majority of the patients have one of three things. They either have fever or they have fatigue or they have dry cough. These are all very common things. There are far less common presentations such as congestion, sore throat, or even diarrhea, these are far less, and all of the above can also be seen with the seasonal flu. We'll get into a comparison in just a little bit. Uh, 
But um, it's also important to note that there can be a cardiac presentation where these patients can have the lining of the heart, which is called the pericardium, um, uh, inflamed. So patients can present with pericarditis, as well as this virus can affect the muscle of the heart, which in medicine we call myocarditis. So some of these patients may present with significant chest pains and bizarre changes on their EKG on uh, presentation to emergency rooms. However, big picture is that of the patients that contract this disease, um, over 80% of them will have mild symptoms that can be managed at home on an outpatient basis while they're quarantining themselves away from the rest of society and as best as possible away from the rest of their family. Um, about 20% of these patients or up to 20% of them may end up requiring hospitalization. Of that 20%, up to half of them uh, at some point may require more significant intensive care um, attention, and a portion of them will end up needing ventilators. And um, by that, we mean that the patient may end up needing to be sedated or paralyzed with a breathing tube that is placed from their mouth, and they're connected to a breathing machine, which we call a ventilator that allows for better oxygenation while the lung is so severely affected with the disease. Uh, but thankfully, the majority of the patients do better. What is the mortality rate of this virus? Well, the mortality rate of this virus can vary depending on how much access to healthcare resources you can have in the area where there's an outbreak. So for example, in places where um, the system is not saturated over or overwhelmed as far as ERs or ICUs. Uh, there can be 1% or a little bit less than 1% for all comers. However, if you are in a place where the systems are all overwhelmed and all the care cannot be given to the patients that need it the most, this life-saving care, you could have as much as 10% in mortality. Uh, which ends up being very close to the SARS virus of 2003, where its mortality, its final mortality was listed about, about 10%. So this idea of social distancing and wanting to uh, delay the spread of the virus as best as possible is really in the best interest of the public in hopes of not overwhelming our healthcare resources and systems. So let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, discussions surrounding this virus. I'll try to be brief about this. One of the comparisons that are made on social media or among friends is, well, this is just another form of the flu. We didn't do this with the flu, with seasonal flu that essentially becomes a pandemic around the globe every year. Why are we doing all these extra measures with this virus? So there are a couple of things that are noteworthy. One is that there's a period we call the incubation period with any virus, which is the period from which when the virus enters the body until the virus causes symptoms of disease. So with the flu, typically this period is shorter. It's in the order of two to four days. And usually the patient is only shedding virus and potentially infecting other people in the 24 hours preceding the onset of symptoms. Whereas with the coronavirus, the uh, incubation period can be as long as two weeks, even though most patients will present between two to six days. And the period during which the patient can be uh, transmitting the virus to other people around them can be longer as much as two, maybe three days. So this makes it very hard because a completely asymptomatic patient may be given the virus to unwittingly to people around them, including loved ones or coworkers or people at their uh, faith communities. Additionally, the hospital duration of the average flu patient, if they were to end up in the hospital, is about five days. The hospital duration of the average coronavirus patient, whether or not they survive it, will be about 11 days. Um, and then there is this thing we call an infectivity number, where on average, one person who gets the influenza virus, the seasonal influenza virus, ends up giving it to about 1.3 individuals around them in the community. That number, if we were to look at the Chinese data, is about 2.5 with coronavirus. Now, 
some cultural differences may also be present. For example, uh, in China, there may not be as much uh, of a culture of hugging or uh, being in that much close contact for people or kissing, things like this. And so perhaps those numbers, the infectivity numbers from one person giving the um, disease to other people around them may even be worse than 2.5. Additionally, there's the mortality comparison. Uh, every year, the seasonal flu can have different levels of virulence, um, but the average number for the seasonal flu is about one in 1,000. However, with the coronavirus, this number is at least 10 times, perhaps 1%. And as I mentioned earlier, if the healthcare resources are absolutely strained and saturated, it can go up to as much as 10% which is majority of people who seek hospital care or intensive care may end up uh, succumbing to their illness. So this comparison does not work very well. So if we were to consider that the same number and every year in the US, something around a quarter to a third of Americans will get the seasonal flu, influenza A and or B. Um, but if the same numbers in America were to get this virus, the number of mortalities uh, would be astronomical, would start from a half a million to multiple million dead Americans. However, if this virus is contained very well, we get the advantage of time on our side. Time, because by delaying uh, new cases, we can care for people who are ill. Time, in that by delaying it, we can find new, more effective therapies from various ICUs in various parts of the world to try to care for these patients in time because perhaps, as with other respiratory viruses, the change in the seasons may decrease the activity of this virus, although that is not proven because this is a novel virus and we don't know. So let's go on a little bit to immune system. Uh, it's a very common question that is asked, well, I need to have a very strong immune system to be able to battle the virus. What do I do? to do this. And there are a lot of remedies over uh, the counter that people prescribe thinking that these things will help with the immune system. The things that are very much proven to improve the health of our immune system are really from three broad categories. One is exercise, and by that I mean particularly aerobic exercise that keeps the blood flowing through the tissues. Two is adequate nutrition. So people who may be deficient in certain vitamins or certain proteins generally or overall malnourished status may have difficulty with mounting a very robust immune response against the virus that may end up their body, uh, entering their body. And we also have good sleep. And by good sleep, I mean several hours of sleep and the people of different age groups may have different needs for sleep. However, having a very predictable sleep schedule of going to bed at a particular time in the evening and waking up at a particular time so that your circadian rhythm, your cortisol surge, your um, the chemicals that your body secretes during sleep pattern all are matched up. The sleep is somewhat like rebooting your system and this rebooting helps with creating a better acuity for our immune system as well. We generally know that people whose sleep patterns are disturbed are more likely to get ill from exposure to various viral diseases, and we think that the coronavirus will not, may not be that different. Let's talk a little bit about how the coronavirus enters our body. Coronavirus does not have any wings to fly to you. It does not have any legs to walk to you. The coronavirus is incapable of reproducing itself. Coronavirus is very easily denatured and destroyed on surfaces and places when it's exposed to the elements over typically several hours at a time. So it's a very weak virus when it's outside the body. When it enters the body though, it's a very different story. Remember that we talked about these projections that are on the surface of the virus. These projections are made out of these glycoproteins. These glycoproteins have a particular affinity, which means the ability to attach to a particular receptor that all of us humans have in our respiratory and GI tract called ACE2 receptors, angiotensin converting enzyme number two receptors. And the affinity with which this virus attaches to those is higher than the previous coronaviruses that we have known. 
previous coronaviruses, when the affinity is less, it means that you need a larger inoculum, which means a larger number of viruses to actually mount an illness. Whereas the higher the affinity, the less number of viruses you need to be able to attach. And so typically, the way this virus uses us to transmit from one person to the next is through close contact. Either somebody uh, sneezes around you or coughs around you um, or typically breathes around you if you're in very close proximity, a person who kisses you in close proximity or touches your hand on which um, on their own hands they may have... Um, sneezed or coughed before and their hands may be contaminated, they touch your hand, the virus cannot get through to you through your skin. The virus still depends on you reaching your hand to your mouth, to your nose, or to your eyes as a means of entering. The virus has an affinity to mucosal surfaces. The skin is not a place where it can go. So frequent hand washing is important because if somebody who is affected with coronavirus had previously been in your room and now you're trying to enter that room or exit that room by touching the doorknob, even if you maintain your social distance from that person, which is typically recommended uh, at about two meters or six feet, you may still contaminate your hand not realizing that you've touched the doorknob and then subsequently by touching your, door, your hand to your face or any mucosal membrane, which is a very common thing, we do that as much as 90 times in a 24 hour period, we will then self inoculate. Once the virus gets um, access to our mucosal surfaces, then it gets to feast. It gets to attach to the ACE2 uh, receptors. It gets to inject its RNA into the uh, cell and it gets to take over the machinery of the cell where the cell will stop doing everything that it was doing before and suddenly becoming a factory for reproduction of this particular virus. So what's very important is hand washing, keeping distance, and knowing full well that the closer you are, the more likely you are to contract the virus. So these policies that have gone into place that seem very draconian, such as keep your distance, even if you're in line to enter a grocery store, keep your distance, all has to do with how logarithmically the number of viruses decrease in the air surrounding the person by maintaining that distance. The more distance you are, the less number of viruses you have. Generally speaking, we think of this virus, and the CDC confirms this, as a droplet transmission virus. By that we mean that very small, tiny amounts of uh, water um, in small particles can float through the air and come to somebody. However, droplets generally are a little bit heavier than particles that get to float around the air. And so over time, they do settle down, which is very important. Diseases that are transmitted by airborne, typically the virus is very light and it gets to float around the air. And if you don't need a whole lot of the virus for infectivity, then it can, in an enclosed space, it can affect everybody. We don't think that generally the mode of transmission of this novel coronavirus is by airborne or aerosol, but we do think that if you're in close enough proximity, it can behave as such. That's why we say keep your distance and at the same time um, take all the extra measures such as hand washing and uh, not touching, not to touch your um, face and your eyes and your nose where mucosal membranes are amply available. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the immune system. Once the virus ends up in the body and ends up taking over various cells, uh, one of the issues that happens is that the immune system realizes that there are cells that are affected that are behaving aberrantly in our body. So the immune system at first mounts a generic response to try to battle the, this intruder into the body. By doing that, there are certain interleukins and inflammatory mediators that the body generates, and it brings the... Uh, the white cells, such as macrophages, to come and try to pick up these cell debris and swallow these viruses that may be floating around within our tissues. And 
Subsequent to that, um, the immune system starts bringing the specialists. The generalists first come in and try to contain the situation as best as possible. The specialists in battles against viruses are our T lymphocytes. The T cells have a, the ability to take the virus in and start thinking of it as a locked, um, as, a, as a lock that is locked and trying to find a key for it. So they start developing various different proteins that we call antibodies that will then attach and try to unlock this key or un, un, try to find the key that unlocks the lock. And so when it does that, once it finds the perfect antibody, it will then deploy it everywhere in the body and try to neutralize the virus. Unfortunately, if the specialists don't, that are working against the clock don't get to develop the antibodies that are proper, which first are in the form of immunoglobulin M, and then they refine it to immunoglobulin G, uh, then the, um, the virus can run amok, infect more and more cells, and by which time, if it's too late and the immune system realizes that there are too many cells affected, and this is beyond repair, the immune system goes into overdrive, overdrive and starts a process that's called complement fixation. At that point, a cascade of difficult inflammatory circumstances happen within the body where um, the immune system itself indiscriminately may affect cells that are affected the, with the virus and cells that are not. So when you see the CT scans of patients who particularly have respiratory distress syndrome and all of this area that's supposed to be nice and blackened and, and for aeration are looking kind of white and gummed up, it's really the, subs the, the consequence of a battle between your immune system and the virus. Sometimes the immune system itself becomes the reason why some patients succumb to this disease. So it's a very significant issue. And when the size of the inoculum, which means the number of viruses that initially enter the body, is larger, the patients may have a more significant severe illness. And this is uh, evidenced by the fact that uh, from the data from China and from Italy and some from the UK, healthcare workers, and the doctors and nurses and technicians who take care of these patients, the respiratory techs, are really at risk of death. And for their age group, they have a higher mortality because the size of the inoculum while taking care of these patients may be much higher, despite all of the protective equipment that they have, that they may not be 100% protective. So uh, I should take this moment to uh, give a shout out to all our, our, of our colleagues who are in very close contact with such patients and are really sacrificing themselves in the process of trying to help the population battle this disease. We, I briefly touched on um, the life of the uh, virus in the air, that typically um, if you were to take it to the laboratory up to three hours, you may be able to find small viral particles that may still be active. Uh, we can't say alive because viruses don't really have a life. It has to do with whether they can be active or viable. Those are the words that are used. But at the same time, uh, usually we think that within 30 minutes uh, of somebody having been in that room, most of that dust is settled as far as infectivity, even though it can be as long as three hours. On surfaces, um, we know from laboratory uh, experiments that on stainless steel and hard metal surfaces, as well as hard plastic surfaces, the virus can last for as long as three days, 72 to 80 hours. Um, on some other surfaces, such as cardboard boxes and things, it can be as long as a day. But lasting on that means that there's still some activity that can be detected. But generally speaking, we think that beyond the first several hours, the chances of that box or that metal door still having infectivity to the next person who touches it continue to diminish logarithmically. And that's a very useful thing. So um, nonetheless, if you get a package in the mail, I wouldn't worry about if the package, let's say, came from Wuhan or came from Italy, where we have a significant disease burden. I would mostly, mostly worry about the person who handled that package and if they unknowingly may have had the virus. So 
perhaps you can have the package sit there for 24 hours before you open it, or if you open it, knowing full well that the virus cannot enter your body through your skin, open it, remove the product, and then sanitize the product as well as sanitize your hands to make sure that you don't unwittingly touch your hand to your face and cause the difficulty. Let's uh, briefly touch um, on uh, some of the conspiracy theories, such as, well, this is a laboratory-made virus by one of the superpowers to try to derail the world economy and all these things. I have particularly listened to um, very prominent uh, virologists, uh, both at Washington University in St. Louis, as well as uh, one from UCSD in San Diego. And they have known coronaviruses for a very long time. And when they look at how these RNA viruses typically go through various different kinds of mutations, and they may pick up different pieces and pieces and bits of DNA from different vectors in which they have uh, caused infectivity. This is just kind of a natural progression of how this virus developed. There are, there are thousands of other kinds of coronaviruses that may not have affinity to any of our receptors that we're not aware of. Nature itself is the biggest laboratory. Such a thing, such a virus, it would be an incredibly difficult task to make in a laboratory. And all of them debunk these history, these stories that somehow there's some um, foul play behind uh, the uh, founding of this virus. This virus uh, is pretty apparent to the virologist that uh, was uh, developed through nature and through the mutations that is very typical of RNA viruses in their life cycles. Um, let's talk about treatments. Uh, so as I mentioned, the treatment generally is supportive once the patient starts showing signs and symptoms, um, supportive, meaning that if they have a mild disease, they just go quarantine themselves and try to not be in touch with other people and wait out the two to three week period that it takes for the virus to go through their system and have them develop immunity and, uh, and be well again. It's also known that for several days after the resolution of symptoms, the patients may still shed virus. So the duration of the quarantine is typically recommended to be beyond the duration of signs and symptoms, perhaps by up to 10 days. Um, additionally, supportive treatment once you end up in the hospital would be anything from, if, if the patient has respiratory symptoms, would be from uh, just supplemental oxygenation to providing non-invasive ventilation, such as CPAP, BiPAP masks to try to avoid ventilation, all the way to intubation, paralyzing or muscular blockade of the patient, placing them on ventilators. And this is where the discussion on ventilators comes in, because uh, we may end up having a deluge of patients that show up to our emergency rooms and end up needing intensive care with the use of a ventilator, and we may not have simply enough ventilators uh, to take care of all of them at once. And so if we flatten the curve through observing all of these rules of social distancing, we may be able to care for these patients who could be saved by providing very significant fancy ventilation, such as very high delivery of peak and expiratory pressure, also known as PEEP, that helps with oxygenation, and even in some rare cases, the need for putting the patient on extracorporeal mem corporeal membrane oxygenation, or ECMO, to try to give the lungs of the patient some time to heal. Uh, some of the other treatments that are currently being tried but are, have not been proven but uh, there is some promise in them, and the FDA has loosened their use uh, on an emergency basis or on a compassionate basis in hopes that they may help patients. Are, there's a 70-year-old drug that's an anti-malarial drug called hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine. Two of them are related drugs that, at least in vitro, which means in the laboratory, has been shown in other coronaviruses to significantly weaken or attenuate the virus. And so the hope is that by taking this, we may be able to change the course of the disease and lessen the mortality of the disease. We also have had in some patients with ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, uh, that become very sick in the ICU or some sepsis patients that 
very high dose vitamin C may be useful. So that is being tried as it was tried in China. The evidence behind it is not clear, but uh, very significant doses of um, vitamin C is being used to try to see if they can stem the tide of mortality and get the patients off the ventilator faster. Because every time you get to have somebody off the ventilator and better, that ventilator becomes available to another patient who may be in dire need. Um, there are, there's work on some antivirals, for example, an antiviral that was developed during the time of Ebola that wasn't particularly useful is being tested to see if it would have some antiviral activity that it could somehow inter, uh, interfere in the replication cycle of this virus to try to help. Um, there's also a very significant amount of work being done by various laboratories around the world to try to develop a vaccine specifically for the coronavirus. Generally speaking, RNA viruses present a bigger challenge mm -hmm. to uh, um, the immunological world and to people who are interested in vaccine development because they, by nature, tend to have a lot more variability and a lot more rate of mutation and change. The viruses that have DNA as their main code tend to have some mechanism for correction of their mistakes from generation to generation, uh, whereas RNA viruses do not have that. So when little changes happen within them, they may look morphologically different enough with their glycoproteins, where even if you were to develop some immunity to a particular form, by the next season, there may be a virus that's significantly different and may not necessarily be susceptible to the immunity that the patient may have developed already. Nonetheless, uh, the hope is that those mutations may decrease the virulence of the virus in the future, and that they may not be as hard and difficult as this particular virus. There's also a mention of azithromycin, which is more known as ZPAC among the uh, population. As you know, that is a, an antibacterial antibi antibiotic. However, um, uh, one of the problems that happen with patients with viral pneumonias is secondary pneumonias. There may also be a slight antiviral activity to this particular medicine that yet is remain, remaining to be seen. However, uh, there is no recommendation for anybody on their own accord to go either on z or on hydroxychloroquine in hopes of preventing um, this particular disease other than being under the supervision of a doctor because these medicines themselves can have side effects, including some rhythm disturbances with the heart. And so uh, you have to weigh the uh, risks versus benefits before you go on such therapies. Um, lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, epidemiology of this. Um, the issue is that when the numbers all uh, have this um, exponential growth, when you look at the curves and they seem that they're just going up so sharply, the only way that these numbers end up going down is either we slow the spread through the distancing and isolating and quarantining and having very significant um, measures in place that are restrictive as far as human interaction to try to stem the tide or you would have to wait until something like nearly half the population has already either gotten the disease and developed some immunity, or perhaps has received a vaccine has developed an immunity where the virus cannot freely jump from one person to the next to the next. Um, I cannot overstress the importance of social distancing in this particular critical juncture in our history. Uh, there have been examples of uh, people in Washington State, about 60 choir members who got together in a church building in somewhat of an enclosed space. None of them coughed a single time. None of them sneezed a single time. None of them touched hands or hugged or kissed at all. They just did a choir practice for about an hour on March 6th. And now several of them are ill and already two of them have died because of the coronavirus. So we know that when we're in close proximity, uh, the virus can act more uh, outside of its usual droplet format and be transferred. We already know that we don't need a whole lot of virus to um, uh, become symptomatic and become ill. And we already know that before we become, we become symptomatic, several days can go by during which time 
we may be unwittingly shedding the virus to our loved ones um, and uh, perhaps spreading it in our communities and making its containment and uh, mitigation much harder. So as a service to people in healthcare who are putting their lives on the line for the care of the public, I ask everybody to take these instructions very seriously to heed the direction of your government, to read only the material that comes out of the CDC or the FDA. Do not try to self-treat. And if you think that you are sick, even with the common cold, out of abundance of caution, stay at home, isolate yourself, either get tested or make sure you don't come in contact with other people because what may appear to be a very light and mild disease to you may be quite deadly to your neighbor and we have a moral obligation to try to minimize the number of uh, the amount of mortality and the stress on resources in the healthcare system this concludes my talk on the coronavirus i thank you very much for listening and one last thing that i wanted to say is there had been a suggestion from southern france that uh, NSAIDs, which are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as ibuprofen, Advil, um, may potentially worsen this disease. We don't exactly know by what mechanism. This has not been proven. The CDC has not specifically advised against the use of this. But out of abundance of caution, if you end up with respiratory symptoms and you want to alleviate the, the fatigue and the body aches and things that you have, perhaps starting with Tylenol, which is acetaminophen as the active ingredient, would be advised. And if you have to use to Advil, please contact your physician and see how things are going. Also, there have been a very significant move made to try to make physicians available by things like FaceTime, video conferencing, Zoom, these kinds of things. So you will have access to your physicians without having to go to their offices and potentially infecting their staff, the doctors themselves, and um, being in close contact with other people. So take every precaution, be safe, and we'll do another update in due time. Uh, my thanks are due to um, uh, Mr. Muzaffari, who made this um, presentation possible and freeeducation.us that invited me to give you this um, uh, quick um, uh, picture of what's going on currently with the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much for listening.